I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, two sad and tragic events in the state of Israel. As Jewish extremists profaned the Torah, the people of Israel, and the Jewish people throughout the world by wantonly taking the life, murdering an 18-month-old Palestinian baby and a 16-year-old Israeli girl. The first occurred during a gay parade, the murder of Shira Banki, who died yesterday at Sharet Tzedek Medical Center from stab wounds she suffered Thursday evening when a religious Jewish fanatic lunatic attacked those participating in an LGBT parade in Jerusalem, knifing six of the marchers, injuring one seriously, and ultimately murdering 16-year-old Shira Banki. The murderer is an ultra-Orthodox Jew living in Modi'in Elite. Just three weeks ago, he had been released from prison after serving 10 years for a similar stabbing in 2005. And then in the early morning hours of the next day, 4 a.m. this past Friday morning in Israel, Jewish religious fanatics attacked and torched with Molotov cocktails two homes in the Palestinian village of Duma in the northern part of the West Bank near the city of Nablus murdering Ali Dawabsheh and seriously injuring the infant's mother, father, and four-year-old brother. An Israeli helicopter airlifted the entire family to the Tel HaShomer Medical Center for emergency treatment. Now it should be noted, this is very important, that the Israeli people are revulsed by each of these murders. And the Israeli government has been absolutely clear in its total condemnation of the Jewish extremists, who are criminals no less guilty of murder than any Palestinian terrorist. Prime Minister Netanyahu said of the arson and murder of Ali Duabsheh that it is a reprehensible and horrific act of terrorism in every respect. And Israeli police are hunting for those responsible and will bring them to justice. And referring to the Jew who murdered Shira Banki and who's now in custody once again. About him, Mr. Netanyahu described him as committing a despicable hate crime antithetical to Israeli values and promised to prosecute Jews who engage in terrorism to the full extent of the law. Well, in the wake of these two tragic murders, one for sure committed by an ultra-Orthodox Jew, and the other the apparent work of a fanatic group of Orthodox Jews on the West Bank, we thought it important to hear from a member of the Orthodox community here in America. And I'm honored to have on our JBS phones once again Rabbi Avi Shafrin, Director of Public Affairs for a Good of Israel of America. Avi, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mark, as always. So, Avi, what would you want to say in response to the murder of Shira Banki and Ali Dawabsheh? Well, I think I can probably just echo exactly what you just said and quoted from Israeli leaders. Um, I would add to what Mr. Netanyahu said, that uh, these things are antithetical to Israeli values, that they are antithetical to... Jewish values. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's, no, there's no defense whatsoever other than insanity, perhaps, and I'm not sure that even that applies here to either of these, um, these tragic um, outrages. Uh, in the case of the, uh, the stabbings, um, as you mentioned, this, this man was, uh, had been convicted and jailed for a decade for precisely the same thing. Yes. Um, he obviously is a, has a fixation um, that does not reflect um, any mainstream ultra-Orthodox or Orthodox or modern Orthodox approach to uh, any issue, he was motivated clearly by hatred. Who else could, could perpetrate such a thing? Yes. And in terms of, in terms of the nationalists, uh, unfortunately, this is a problem that 
uh, Israel faces and has faced for a long time of people who have a certain, as you put it, fanaticism. In this case, it's a, even if they happen to be people who um, live religious lives, quote unquote, uh, the fanatic aspect of their lives is a nationalistic one, and uh, they are terrorists in every single um, meaning of the word. They should be treated no differently than any Arab terrorist or any Muslim terrorist. Avi, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to have you come on JBS and say it so unequivocally. You know, uh, the audience should understand within the Orthodox world there are also various movements, and there is the movement of, of modern Orthodoxy, and then there's Agud of Israel, which is associated with a more mainstream and more observant form, even observant in the Orthodox world, uh, form of Orthodoxy. and you represent a good of Israel. And I am worried that there may be some, I'm not even worried about people who are not Jewish. Avi, what worries me is that there may be some Jews who say, oh, you see, this is what orthodoxy is. And this is the, the evil of Judaism. And it leads to a certain kind of fanaticism and, and people who, who take the Torah literally and believe it's from heaven, from God, Minashamayim, as you do, they will somehow try to justify this act. And then I speak to you, and, and you are as unequivocal in your condemnation as has been virtually the entire Israeli public and the Israeli government. But you know what I'm talking about, Avi, and speak to that for a moment, the extent to which even you confront every now and then people who assume because you take Judaism very seriously and you believe it is, again, Torah Menashamayim, that it comes from God, Torah Mi Sinai, that somehow you're going to take a much more lenient position when Jewish fanatics are, are guilty of this kind of heinous murder. Well, that is not just a fear, it's a, uh, it's a fact, unfortunately, that it's already been done, even by people, believe it or not, within the Jewish world, who um, point fingers and seem to uh, interpret uh, such things, which, by the way, are, are denounced by across the board. Everyone, I, every, every ultra-Orthodox Jew or Haredi Jew that heard the news of either of these outrages, and I can guarantee you from speaking to a broad range of them that everyone had the exact same reaction of, of, of their heart falling and their being, uh, being uh, plunged into mourning over the terror of the act themselves and the way that it reflects, unfortunately, and I'd say wrongly, on the uh, larger um, Haredi community. Yes. Um, what, uh, I've already seen articles that have pointed fingers in that direction. And I, I just wrote a response to one, actually, for the foreword. Um, someone there pointed out, uh, tried to make the case that um, this is just a natural outcome of the teachings of the Haredi world, which, is, which we don't make no bones about, that we believe that you know, homosexual activity is forbidden by the Torah. So this is just a natural outgrowth of it. And the, one of the points I made, and I think it's a very germane point, is that um, there have been only two incidents of violence against gays in Israel over the past 20 years. Two. It was the same fellow in both cases. That means that the hundreds of thousands of Haredi Jews who, according to the, this writer, have been educated to hate and to want to do harm to people who they consider to be engaging in sinful behavior, which all of us do to one or another degree, whether it's this sin or that sin, whether it's gossip or whether it's eating something that's questionably kosher, whatever it might be, uh, that, that the, the, um, the uh, assumption that because uh, someone has a, a deep-seated belief about right and wrong, that somehow it's going, it's going to lead to violence, um, is belied by the fact that of the hundreds of thousands of Haredi Jews, only one has come forth in his evil or in his derangement, I don't know what it is, and committed violence. Yes. And same guy, to oh. only two times. Yes. If, you go, if you go online and look for anti-gay violence, there's a Wikipedia page there, which this country by country, um, the uh, outrages in many countries have many such outrages, people who attack others simply because they disapprove of their lifestyles. And Israel has, has won, and now it's two. And again, it's the same fellow in both cases. 
what does that say? It says to me, and it should say to everyone, that uh, this isn't just an outlier. This is a, a crazy person. Yes. It's a person who doesn't represent anyone but himself. Avi, what about the other incident where you have, again, fanatic Orthodox Jews on the West Bank who want to take in some, be, who engage in violence and actually now murder a Palestinian baby. And, you know, I remember when Palestinians broke into a, an Israeli home and murdered a child in the child, while the child was asleep, murdered the entire family, in fact. And it was just, you know, it gives me, it gave me chills then, it gives me chills now. And one of the things that we said was, is this is not something that Jews do. And part of the, the Shanda here is that it undermines the Jews' ability to say unequivocally, this isn't what Jews do. And I need, again, for you to speak a little bit to how you would, how would you would confront Orthodox Jews on the West Bank who would say to you, look, God gave us this land. The Palestinians and the Arabs who are on this land are preventing us from achieving a certain kind of spiritual sovereignty and literal political sovereignty. And they are constantly creating havoc and sometimes inflict violence and even death upon us. And therefore, in some way, it is justifiable. What would you say to that, Avi? I would say that the definition of an orthodox mindset is that we recognize the fact that we are in Galut, that we are in exile, and that the land that God promised us will one day be ours, but not through the actions of man, but through the actions of the coming of the Messiah, may it be quickly in our days. The bottom line is, a great Israeli Haredi leader who once said that, that um, the life of a Jewish child is worth more than any amount of land that one might feel he has to conquer and to, to push the, uh, the envelope, so to speak, and to try to, to take land or to arrange things so that land can be captured in, in Israel. Jewish land that the Bible says is the Jewish land is wrong because we don't have a, we're not a, um, a post-Messianic world. We are living in the world of what we call Galut, we call exile. And in that state, we, can, we, we live to some degree at the mercy of the rest of the world, and we have to deal with things um, in a reasonable manner, not in a, uh, in a manner of uh, how Joshua may have dealt with it when on God's uh, direct command he entered uh, the Eretz Israel and conquered it. That's not where we are today. Mm -hmm. But I'm, getting, I'm a little bit off what I wanted to say before. I, I uh, drifted a bit. Um, the essence of orthodoxy is to follow one's leadership. And the leadership might be a Haredi one. It might be a religious Zionist one, which is, has a certain element of nationalism to it. Or it might be um, you know, a, a modern orthodox one that's not necessarily uh, um, Zionistic or nationalistic. There is no... Jewish religious leader anywhere on that spectrum that would countenance in any way what these um, fanatical nationalists are doing. Mm -hmm. Not one. Mm -hmm. They don't have anyone on whom they rely. They rely on their own feelings, and that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Avi, as always, it is wonderful to get your perspective. I am so grateful I can always call you, and you are always both perceptive and articulate. So I will call you often, my friend. Thank you very much. I, I, I value your, your, uh, your doing that and, uh, and the opportunity to speak to uh, your viewers. And may we all hear good news coming from Israel Absolutely. and from everywhere in the Jewish and the, the wider world. Thank you so much. You are. Bye-bye. Rabbi Avi Shafrin, the Director of Public Affairs for Agudath Israel of America. We also thought it's important to hear an Israeli perspective to both of these tragic events, and I'm very pleased to have on our JBS phones from Israel the chief political correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, Gil Hoffman. Gil, thank you for joining us. Pleasure being with you. Thank you, Gil. Gil, what's been the general Israeli reaction to the murders of Shira Banki and Ali Dawabsheh? And is a distinction made, Gil, because one was an Israeli teenager who was killed, and one was a Palestinian baby. Well, absolutely no distinction whatsoever. A hate crime is a hate crime. Terror is terror. And 100% except for crazies on the fringe, um, 
are deploring this and condemning both acts equally um, as completely disgusting and not the way of Israel or the Jewish people. Okay, boy, you say it perfectly, and I love the fact they are crazy lunatics. Okay, I want to take them one at a time, Gil. How often do you feel ultra-Orthodox fanatics commit violent acts against fellow Jews in Israel? You know, the, the very fact that every time it happens, it's a big headline that shows how little it happens. Yes. Unfortunately, there are, there are, there are attacks by uh, Arabs against Jews uh, pretty much every day. I mean, there was a, a Molotov cocktail today thrown at a 27-year-old woman who was severely injured. You know, in America, there's a danger now, Gil, that people will say, well, you see, Israel's the same as the Palestinians. There's violence to and from in both directions. How would you respond to that? The numbers would suggest otherwise. The numbers would suggest that that point of view is ridiculous. Uh, there are literally hundreds of attacks of Arabs against Jews a year, and the amount of attacks of Jews against Arabs can be counted uh, you know, on, a, on a hand or two. Yes. Um, it's absolutely horrible. And, and also, the, the, um, how it, the attacks are received in their own communities. I mean, every time an Arab kills a Jew here, they treat him like a hero in his community. They name streets after him. Uh, they name schools after them. Whereas the Jews who have committed these acts uh, are seen as the most vile people uh, in society and the one who stabbed people at the gay parade 10 years ago received only a 12-year sentence and was released after 10 years. Now, Gil, some Israeli politicians, even for, former President Shimon Peres, or I even saw David Brin, the managing editor of the Jerusalem Post on IBA News last night, there's a suggestion that Benjamin Netanyahu is somehow responsible for both of these murderous incidents because he's created a climate that makes them possible. To what extent, Gil, do you feel this is a fair charge? Well, not at all. I mean, um, we have all different points of view in our government from... Um, from very right wing uh, to uh, Michael Oren, who's in favor of withdrawing from the overwhelming majority of the West Bank. We have people religiously who are ultra orthodox and people who are ultra secular. Um, actually, have a, a very varied government that I think it, it, it's painted as too extreme in, in American media, um, who I think don't get it. Um, I don't think that there's any atmosphere whatsoever in this country that can condone or encourage any uh, of these attacks that have taken place. Mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has come out very strongly both against both of these incidents, these, these tragic events, also promising to prosecute to the full extent of the law. Is your sense that Israeli justice, the way the system works, ultimately, when things of this nature happen, and your point is they happen very rarely, when they do happen, Israeli law and the system in Israel works properly? The answer is I feel much more confident in the way the legal system works here than I do in America. Mm -hmm. um, I feel much more safe and confident living in, in a country that recognizes that big legal decisions need to be made by legal experts. Uh, I, I frankly I don't understand how anyone can feel confident um, that justice would be done in the system that America has. I have you on the phone, Gil, so I can't have you on without asking you what your take is on the Iran nuclear accords. And as we record, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is speaking to the, the world, um, expressing his opinion. But as you look at it, both as an Israeli and as a chief correspondent, chief political correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, and is simply an ordinary citizen of Israel. What's your sense of the Iran deal? When I get interviewed, it's not my own opinion that matters. It's, it's not my wear two hats. I wear the hat of the uh, expert on what the Israeli government thinks and often can't say, 
So when you have 85% of Israelis who are against this deal, it's not even a question. I mean, I, I know that there are left-wing groups in America who are trying to highlight that there are security officials. I myself wrote about some former security officials who then uh, joined uh, left-wing parties uh, who have actually said that even though they disagree with the deal, it's the best thing possible now, and we shouldn't be fighting anymore. But no, 85% of Israelis are against the deal. It's not even close. And every time Barack Obama opens his mouth, more Israelis are against the deal. The most worrisome thing that Barack Obama said about the deal that made Israelis more scared was when he said, I'm going to be around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Israelis were really hoping that there would be a new president who would come and have more security experience and understand the Middle East more, and he would go away. And when he said that I'm going to stay around, uh, that terrifies Israelis. They see all the havoc that has been wreaked in this region over the last six years, and uh, Israelis are only getting more and more scared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gil, what's the very worst part of the Iran deal? The, the lack of oversight. Um, that. Uh, Iran can get away with doing virtually whatever they want uh, without anyone checking the fact that it doesn't address uh, any of the threats to Israel at all. In fact, gives money that can be billions that can be used for Hamas and Hezbollah and the human rights abuses against their own people. Uh, the fact that none of that was taken into account yes. is just sad. Um, and uh, we hope uh, that that can translate into Congress doing what's right for America. So um, there's not a lot of chance for that. Chances are uh, enough congressmen will try to please uh, an outgoing president of the United States instead of trying to keep their constituents safe. You know, there are many Jews also, Gil, who seem afraid to make this an issue for fear that they will be charged with the old canard of a dual loyalty and that the only reason they're against this deal is because they care about Israel, that it's not, it's not in America's interest as it is in Israel's interest to stop Iran. And therefore, what motivates Jews is not a love of America, but their concern for the state of Israel. And there are some Jews who are actually, it seems to me, backing away from putting pressure on legislators in Congress out of that fear. Again, you have a unique perspective as an American who's made Aliyah. What is your, what would your advice be to American Jewry right now? Uh, to not let a, a crazy man get a nuclear weapon, which is what this deal would, would facilitate. There's nothing to do with Israel. It never has had anything to do with Israel uh, because uh, America is who the Iranians want to destroy. I mean, they talk in the same sense of destroying Israel and destroying America. Um, they have Venezuela there as their ally. Venezuela is a lot closer to America than it is to Israel. Uh, they have every reason as Americans to be afraid um, without having to do with Israel at all. Um, and, you know, the only reason any loyalty is being questioned is because the President of the United States has this extreme point of view. Had any other president been in power, it, it wouldn't be that way. And, and another president will be in power. And after that, it's all going to change. It's going to be a president who understands the Middle East more, um, who's not going to make decisions like this. It's going to be easier to be an American Jew. Mm -hmm. It's going to be easier to be an American Democrat. Um, it's all going to get better. And it's not that far away. Gil Hoffman, it is always wonderful to share your perspective. It's good to see you when you visit America. It's good to see you on the phone. So we'll call you off and you continue your wonderful work. Pleasure being with you. Thank you. Gil Hoffman, the chief political correspondent for the Jerusalem Post. And you know, as horrific as these acts are, and they profane the Torah, the state of Israel, the Jewish people, as horrific and unacceptable as they are. The truth is, every society has its crazies, its lunatics. And religious fanatics are often the worst of them all.
Be wary of those who say they're sure they know they're doing the will of God. For in God's name, they'll feel entitled to do anything, including commit murder. And so the Jewish people have their ultra-Orthodox lunatic extremists, a very small slice of the Orthodox community. And the real test of any society is how that society responds to its lunatic fringe and lunatic violence. And you've seen how virtually unanimous the response has been of the Israeli people and the Israeli government to totally condemn those responsible, whether at a gay pride parade or a Palestinian village. No one's celebrating. No one's handing out candy. No streets are being named for fanatics who take the lives of others. These acts, as gut-wrenching as they are, do nothing to undermine the goodness and morality of the Israeli people and the State of Israel. And all of us here at JBS extend our heartfelt condolences to the families of Shira Banki and Ali Dawabsheh. A program note, tomorrow at 1 p.m., Tuesday, 1 p.m., JBS will be carrying live the remarks of Benjamin Netanyahu as he discusses the Iran nuclear deal. 1 o'clock, Tuesday afternoon. My thanks, as always, to Director Sloan Copeland, Production Coordinator Serge Goldberg, JBS Associate Director Dara Golub, and to the producer of this edition of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.